We're now in public session as we now have a quorum. I call the meeting to order. Apologies have been received from Deputy Ono Brin and Deputy Function is being substituted this morning by Deputy Morris Quinlevin and Deputy Mick Wallace has been substituted by Deputy Joan Collins. In accordance with the standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedure and Privileges for paperless committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I propose we now go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? We're now in public session. Thank you. Good morning and you're all very welcome. At the outset I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue so, to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements being submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on criticise or make charges against a person outside the House, or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd like to welcome uh, the Insolvency Service of Ireland, who are represented this morning by Mr Lorcan O'Connor, Ms Anita Jordan and Mr John Warren. You're very welcome and thank you for your attendance. Uh, you have submitted uh, considerable documentation, thank you very much. And at this stage, uh, Mr O'Connor, if you'd like to make an opening statement, I think which probably summarises uh, much of what you've submitted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to contribute to your deliberations on the issues of housing and homelessness. I'm joined by my colleagues Anita Jordan and John Moran, and hopefully after the opening statements together we can answer uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, mortgage arrears, as you're well aware, is one area amongst many that impacts on the issues of housing and homelessness. While it's not possible to keep every borrower who is in financial difficulty in their home, my message today is that there are a number of options open to such borrowers and that the Personal Insolvency Acts offer statutory protections to people in relation to their family home and that they should always be considered in advance of allowing repossession proceedings to commence. At the outset, I will briefly give committee members an overview of the Insolvency Service of Ireland, often referred to as the ISI. And we are an independent statutory body established in 2013, and our main objective is to return insolvent persons to solvency. We have four debt solutions that come under our remit. Firstly, the debt relief notice. This is a solution for borrowers with very little income and very few assets. The solution allows for the complete write-off of debts up to €35,000. Secondly, we have the debt settlement arrangement, and this is a solution that allows borrowers settle their unsecured debts for a period of up to five years, with any remaining balance at that point written off. And thirdly, we have the personal insolvency arrangement, known as the PIA. It's similar to the debt settlement arrangement in that it too deals with unsecured debts, but it also settles or restructures secure debt, which includes family home mortgages. And it contains some very specific protections for borrowers in mortgage arrears who wish to retain their family home. And lastly, the ISI also administers the functions assigned to the official assignee in bankruptcy. Personal insolvency can result in mortgage default and the ultimate loss of a home. But for tenants, personal insolvency can also have a similar outcome due to an inability to meet rent obligations. The solutions provided by the ISI can help in either scenario. Our debt solutions deal with all levels and types of personal debt and they are life-changing. In Appendix 4 to your pack, I have shared with you some of the feedback that we have received from our customers on uh, the solutions provided by the ISI and what it has meant for them. The reality is that there are thousands of borrowers in Ireland who are insolvent, and many of those are in fear of losing their home. 
For the short time that I have with you today, I will focus on the protections our solutions can provide for mortgage borrowers, in particular the PIA, which enables a borrower to remain in the family home. To begin with, it's worth highlighting the importance of being able to remain in the family home and the fact that that is recognised in the PIA. A PIA is a court-approved agreement between creditors and a borrower which allows for the restructuring and write-off of debt while keeping the borrower in the family home in the majority of cases. We know that borrowers can feel intimidated at the prospect of dealing with their lender. We also know that when a person is behind on their repayments, phone calls and letters from their lender can be overwhelming. But once a borrower decides to apply for a PIA, the PIP will help in the negotiations with the lender. And that very first stage involves the court issuing what's termed a protective certificate. And this means that the borrower is immediately protected from the, the lender, be it in terms of enforcement or contact for 70 days, while the personal insolvency practitioner works out uh, an arrangement that will hopefully keep the people in their family home. We give examples of successful PIAs in Appendix 1 to your pack, and features of many of the PIAs that have been put in place to date include solutions that uh, um, extend to extension of the mortgage term, a reduction in the mortgage interest rate that might apply to the mortgage, the write-off of unsecured debt, and on average we see a write-off of about 90% of unsecured debt. And this is important as the demands from unsecured creditors can often undermine an otherwise sustainable mortgage uh, around the family home. We've also seen a large number of split mortgage solutions where there's complete clarity as to what happens to the warehoused amount, and that's certainly an important element from our perspective and a necessity according to our legislation. And we've also seen some write-off of negative equity uh, on the mortgage. In the minority of cases where creditors have rejected a proposed PIA that a, a personal insolvency practitioner has developed, insolvent borrowers since the end of last year can now seek a court review. And this legislative enhancement, in effect, means that the so-called bank veto has been removed. I now wish to turn to the sensitive issue of repossessions. The fact that a borrower is facing repossession doesn't necessarily mean that they will automatically lose their home. The Land and Conveyancing Law Reform Act contains a provision allowing for the adjournment of home repossession cases for a period of up to two months to enable a borrower consult with a personal insolvency practitioner to explore whether they can put in place a personal insolvency arrangement. And over the past year, representatives of the ISI, in association with MABS, have been present at courthouses around the country, providing borrowers attending repossession hearings with information around their options. And it is important for borrowers to realise that even if they have received letters stating that their mortgage is unsustainable, even if they have received letters threatening repossession, it's still not too late to sort out their financial difficulties. But the first step is to talk to a personal insolvency practitioner. In your briefing materials at Appendix 1, I've included some real-life cases uh, of instances where borrowers were faced with repossession. They were in the repossession courts, but having contacted a, a personal insolvency practitioner, they did reach a solution that kept them in their family home. Just as a ex uh, further example, the very first case in your pack involved a husband and wife with two school-going children. And they consulted with the PIP last summer, but they had resigned themselves to being homeless by Christmas. They had already contacted the local authority to see whether there could be alternative accommodation uh, made available, and they were told that unfortunately the list is so long it would be highly unlikely. But it just so happened that a personal insolvency practitioner was in court that day. Those borrowers had not been aware of the existence of a PIP or what they could do, but having engaged with that PIP, the PIP was able to put a solution in place and they actually, were, I can only assume, enjoyed that Christmas in their family home. And they now have certainty in relation to that family home until the death of the longest surviving spouse. So they no longer have to worry about losing that home um, in effect for, for the rest of their lives. 
I now wish to turn briefly to bankruptcy and specifically what happens to the family home in bankruptcy, where an insolvency arrangement under the Personal Insolvency Act is not possible given a person's particular circumstances, bankruptcy may well be the right action, course of action for him or her. As you will be aware, the bankruptcy term has recently been reduced to one year, and under the amended bankruptcy legislation, the family home can revest in the bankrupt person in specific circumstances. The official assignee, the official who manages the estates of bankrupts, is based within the insolvency service, and Appendix 2 to your pack sets out how he deals with the family home in bankruptcy. I'm happy to talk through the appendix if members wish me to do so, but while there are specific statutory protections around the family home in the Personal Insolvency Acts, it is not correct to say that a borrower will automatically lose their home in bankruptcy in, in all cases. I now wish to turn to the issue of communications and supports for debtors. Since our establishment, the ISI has directly assisted over 3,000 borrowers. And when you, when you look at the number of people often involved in relation to mortgages, extended family and children, uh, you can multiply the number of people affected by that. And as you will see from our testimonials contained in the pack, the feedback from those borrowers who have availed of our service is very positive. While not everyone in financial difficulty will need to avail of our services, and borrowers should always try and resolve their difficulties with their lender in the first instance, it is also clear that the ISI needs to get the message out to people in distress that there is help available. In May of last year, the then government agreed a number of measures to support those in mortgage arrears, and included in those measures was a requirement for the ISI to have a sustained awareness campaign. The ISI recognises the importance of communicating effectively and to drive the awareness of our debt solutions, we have developed a campaign specifically aimed at debtors known as Back on Track. We've developed a specific website, new easy to understand materials, which I've, I've left uh, with, with um, the, 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 the support for, for, for this committee, and they're available to you if you wish. A variety of outreach and awareness raising initiatives are also ongoing, and other various activities, including advertisements in, in several uh, mediums. The ISI continues to expand our campaign, and we plan for a renewed campaign uh, later in the year. Finally, in January of this year, the Minister for Justice and Equality announced a new scheme to access the indep independent legal and, uh, and financial advice for those in mortgage arrears. In recent months, the ISI has been working closely with a number of other stakeholders, including the Department of Justice and Equality, Department of Social Protection, Citizens Information Board, MABS and the Court Service, as well as the Legal Aid Board, to launch the scheme. And it is expected to be launched in the very near future. And I believe this service will play a very important role in helping to address the issue of mortgage arrears. Borrowers will now get the appropriate professional advice that they need when they need it, and there will be no cost to the borrower. MABS will act as the gateway to this service and refer cases to personal insolvency practitioners where appropriate. So, to conclude, it was clear to all observers during the recent election campaign and during the government formation talks that housing and homelessness are at the forefront of people's minds, and by extension so too was the issue of mortgage arrears. The debt solutions offered by the ISI that I've briefly outlined can help, whether it be a mortgage holder in arrears or a tenant unable to meet their rent due to other debts, our solutions restore people to solvency and aim to keep the people or the person in their family home and allow them a fresh start. Many of the 3,000 borrowers we have helped face the threat of losing their home, but no longer have the stress or the strain that insolvency can cause. I expect the numbers of alien of our services to increase significantly over the coming months, and this will be assisted by the new service of access to advice uh, that I just referred to, further publicity campaigns, additional commitments contained within the new programme for government, and no doubt the valuable work of this committee. So thank you, Chair, for the opportunity for the opening remarks and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr O'Connor, for your opening statement. <clears throat>
I'm going to take questions from a number of deputies uh, grouped together, and at that st stage I'll call on you, or Mr Warren, or Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jordan to respond and just remind colleagues at the outset we agreed we would keep the questions direct and because of the time and we're doing a double session this morning so Deputy Durkin if you'd like to start. Thank you Chairman uh, I welcome our guests this morning can I ask Kate, uh, just a couple of quick questions to, I, I note the, the reference to the gradual reduction of the number of mortgages in arrears can you give some indication as to the number of those uh, settlements that were reached uh, in, 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 by way of re resolution to the satisfaction of the borrower or by way of repossession? Uh, the, 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 the difference between, between the two or if, for instance, you mentioned that you assisted 3,000 borrowers, um, can you give us any indication as to what was the totality of the number of cases you dealt with and what proportion of those cases were satisfactorily resolved to the satisfaction of the borrower? Can you also um, uh, in, give some indication as to the extent to which, in the course of your work, you have monitored the activities of lenders who have persistently pursued borrowers by way of uh, telephone calls and emails and letters, uh, which would uh, have the effect of intimidating the borrower, forcing the borrower into a situation whereby they were deemed to have voluntarily surrendered their home. In other words, it, 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 it appears they voluntarily surrendered their home, but did not. And the last question, Mr. Chairman, is in relation to um, uh, the extent to which you examine a case uh, uh, with particular reference to the manner uh, in which the, the borrowing was entered into in the first instance, the degree to which the lending authority applied good banking practice when awarding a loan which they are now vigorously pursuing in terms of potential repossession. Deputy Dirk and Deputy Harty. Um, two of my questions have already been asked. We'll go um, to the third one then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I was wondering, is there a, requ a requirement on, on the banks to inform the client of the existence of the insolvency agency, or do they have to find it out through advertising and, and local media? Is there an obligation that they should direct their clients towards you? Thank you, Deputy Harty. Deputy Cowan. Thanks, Chair. Um, the question of bank vetoes or something you know, that we were all disappointed, or many of us were disappointed, wasn't included in the initial legislation that was brought up, brought out to set up um, your authority and your, your service. I know that eventually there was a change to that legislation, which, which I think allowed the banks to at least, or, or the courts to consider the proposals and make a judgment on the proposals that was forthcoming. But there was a delay then with the court rules in relation to the provision of that service by the court, the provision of that, 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 that that uh, authority by the courts. Has that been rectified? And if it has, can you give some indication of any uh, overturning of any such veto by the banks, uh, subsequently overturned by the courts, which would seem, in my mind then, to indicate the folly of the initial decision, but at least it's been rectified and there's potential for it to be, to, to be better over the coming years. Thank you, Deputy Count. And the final one in this group is Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you. Just thank you very much. And just two questions. When you mentioned the new scheme, um, and you're envisaging that the numbers availing of the service will increase, and in the new scheme you were mentioning a range of organisations, and I was just wondering if you'd indicate how that will work in practice for the, the person who needs that service, and if you have the resources and the staff to deal with that increase in numbers. And the second one is you mentioned also working with tenants and their rents, and if you could give me some more detail on what exactly you do in that case. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy O'Sullivan. Mr O'Connor, you have a number, a range okay, of questions uh, and, there. And, and hopefully I've, I've, I've jotted them all down here, and if, if not, just, just raise them again. Um, the, the first set of questions had to do with the, the lending practices uh, of, of the banks, uh, and I suppose from an insolvency perspective, um, I would encourage creditors and debtors always to look forward rather than to look back. 
you have a bad loan, it needs to be fixed. Whatever the reasons might have been for, for what caused that bad loan are, to, to a large extent, uh, irrelevant. Uh, but we wouldn't necessarily, we, sorry, we don't look into the specific lending practices that gave, gave rise to the, the arrears issue. But what a personal insolvency practitioner does do is deal with that in a way that returns the, the debtor to solvency. In terms of the engagement from banks, um, I, I would have to say that it has been positive. Uh, we have been dealing with banks very closely in developing uh, protocols that sort of encapsulate the, the, the small print and the terms and conditions around our arrangements, and we've had very constructive engagement with banks and all other stakeholders, from debtor advocacy groups through to practitioners, through to MABs and, and the court service, uh, in the development of that. But we have also published statistics around the number of arrangements that failed to, to be delivered by a personal insolvency practitioner. So this is where banks have chosen to vote against an arrangement, which goes, I think, to your, to your first question. So our statistics show that there is close on 80% acceptance rates um, for our arrangements. Uh, so they would always be to the satisfaction of the debtor because it is the debtor who tables the proposal in the first instance. Um, uh, on that. And perhaps then that's linked to the, to the so-called bank veto question. Um, that legislation was passed at the end of last summer. Uh, you're right to say that the court rules had to be developed to sort of back that up, but that went live at the end of November. So we do have a number of cases in the system. Only a small number have come out the other end. So uh, as far as we are aware, there is just short of 50 uh, court reviews uh, in the system. Uh, so this is 50 cases where a personal insolvency practitioner is saying to the court that, Judge, we don't think the, the banks or the creditors were acting reasonably and we would like you to review it and, if you agree with us, impose this solution over the, the will of the banks. Um, so far, 11 cases. I, I think this goes to another thing, just a very quick clarification. Yep. Is, is, is there not a certain amount of uh, timidity about the, the way the insolvency system approaches. For example, I deal with cases, and all of our members here deal with cases on behalf of constituents as well. One of the things that has shown up again and again and again are situations where the bank tells the borrower now at this stage that the, their case is, 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 is uh, in, that they're insolvent, uh, that it, their case is unsustainable. Where four or five years previous to that, the same lending institution deemed that the case was sustainable and awarded a loan that was way in advance of what could or should have been awarded under good banking practices. Now, unless the insolvency services challenge that in court, then the borrower is always going to lose. Derek, sorry, Mr. O'Connor. Well, just to finish the point on the statistics, and I'll go back to that, that point. Those that have gone through the process, 11 so far, um, one of those has been rejected by the court based on, on technical eligibility criteria, so that leaves 10, and eight of those have been found in favour of the debtor. Uh, and the other two, um, we are not aware of the outcome because the case was actually withdrawn, um, but, but there have been eight that have ultimately re uh, resulted in a, in a solution that backs up the, the debtor's original position. Yes. Yeah. Is there any indicate? Well, I, don't, I know we don't want to cry over spilled milk, but it's unfortunate that the same provision wasn't in the initial legislation in order to help and assist families who were not satisfied that the bank had exercised fair play in the veto that they had the power to enforce. I suppose the, the, the hope that I would retain is that actually the number of court reviews will remain relatively low because hopefully now those banks uh, tabled with this, a similar solution in the future will, will act differently and, and that is ultimately in, in, everybody, in everybody's interest. Yeah. Um, another question then was in relation to whether or not the banks have an obligation to inform um, borrowers of the fact that the insolvency service have solutions available to them. Uh, they do as part of the central bank regulations around various notifications to borrowers refer to our solutions, but I think it would be fair to say that it is in um, 
legalese and in a letter that runs to several pages so that there is room for improvement in trying to, to make those communications. And the BPFI have certainly indicated that they are open uh, to, to any suggestions in that regard. But I think it is telling and it is a challenge for the insolvency service and, and, and stakeholders more widely that we had two very successful uh, events recently in Mallow and in Castle Bar where we invited debtors to book a free session with a personal insolvency practitioner for an hour to uh, get some advice as to whether or not a solution could be found for them. Both of those uh, events were oversubscribed. Uh, over 100 debtors uh, and borrowers were met through those two events. And in over 80% of those cases, we were able to identify a solution uh, for those, those individuals. And in the majority of those cases, they have already moved to the first stage of a protective certificate. So, and that's in the space of only two to three weeks. So there are real solutions there. And we have asked those people, why didn't you go to a person insolvency practitioner sooner? And then the, the feedback was either, I'd never heard of them, I never knew of the solutions that you provided, or the other piece of feedback was, I thought personal insolvency practitioners charged uh, hundreds of euro or thousands of euro even for the service, and that is not the case. And that is, as I said, the challenge for us, I suppose, to get that message clearly out to the public and, and those um, in difficulty. Um, the, 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 the last question was in relation to this new service and, and how it will operate. Uh, at its most simplistic level, hopefully the message will be clear for, for borrowers. You no longer have to worry about what specific solution is best for you. You no longer have to worry about having any money to pay for that service. Simply call MABS, who will act, act as a gateway, and refer you to the right person uh, there and then. And in, uh, obviously, with regard to, to our, our sector, that would be a personal insolvency practitioner. But that isn't to stop a debtor who is informed just going direct to a personal insolvency practitioner, and they will get all the supports available there. So the kind of supports that you would get, firstly, is a free uh, consultation with the personal insolvency practitioner, and they would do a full review of your financial affairs, produce what's called a, a prescribed financial statement, which is sort of a, a snapshot of your financial circumstances, and give you written advice around what your, your best options are. And if that is one of the solutions we provide, they will run with that case through to, to finalisation. If it isn't, they will refer the person back to within MAB, so they're not left in limbo. They're constantly uh, looked after from within the, the overall service. And then there are other supports to, to uh, ensure that if a, a borrower needs to take a court review where a bank has, has, has voted against a proposal, that they, they, know they don't have to worry about the cost of that review. And also, if there is a specific legal issue at play, whatever that might be, and with regard to the, the arrears problem, that they have a free consultation uh, with solicitors. So it's whatever the professional advice you need, it's free and at the point of need. And the, the simplicity of the message will hopefully um, engage those that perhaps through fear or, or, or other reasons haven't yet engaged. And that simple message is call MABS or this helpline number, they'll put you in touch with the right person or go to your PIP directly. Mr. O'Connor, uh, Deputy, sorry. Tenants, tenants and rents, the work you're doing with tenants. Um, and, and this is an issue that we've seen uh, in a large number of cases, that um, quite often a tenant might have several debts, uh, the credit card, the overdraft, the personal loan, or, or, or whatever it might be. And these are people knocking on the door, making demands, and in addition to that, you have the landlord saying, well, you, you owe me several hundred euro every month. And the difficulty is you're, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul or you just can't pay all of your debts. But what a personal insolvency practitioner can do there is issue a protective certificate which stops everybody making contact with you. If a, if a creditor were to phone you or make any, even, even issue a letter of demand, they're breaking the law. And that then gives the comfort to the debtor. They no longer have the worries uh, in that regard. And the personal insolvency practitioner then can make your debts sustainable. And within that, they will always allow sufficient monies to keep a roof over your head. So therefore, let's say your rent is 700 euro a month. They will allow you retain 700 euro a month before you have to offer anything to your creditors. 
Uh, and as I said, the, the average write-off of unsecured debt uh, is in the region of 80 to 90 per cent. So it's a very significant um, help or assistance to people who are renting. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. Uh, Deputy Collins. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Lorcan, for that introduction. Um, it seems to be that things are moving on. It's far... The situation now facing people through the personal insolvency seems to be people are in a better position to be able to negotiate with the banks through a PIP. But are you saying that the PIPs now... At the beginning, I think, um, the feeling was that only if, if you had money could you engage a PIP. If you hadn't got money, you, 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 you were high and dry. Who pays the PIP now? through the personal insolvency, um, because it was quite a lot of money originally. Um, you're saying there are 80% of cases that you deal with are generally negotiated and the banks accept your proposals. What happens to the other 20%? And where people are at the moment, we've seen quite a lot recently, um, particularly in rural areas where people are finding themselves facing evictions and that. At what stage, what late stage can the PIP um, by the person's solvency agency actually intervene in for those people who are in courts, can they immediately ring you up and say, listen, I need assistance or we need to stay for three months or four months or whatever is necessary? Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you, how are you finding working with, or do you work with the local authorities? Because we have a situation where we have a, a, a man who got a, with his mother had um, taken a huge um, mortgage, taken out a huge mortgage with a bank, the mother died and he's left with it now. Now the, the local authorities are telling us that they can't put him on the housing list pending he has a housing need, which is only when the, it, 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 the case might happen that he loses his home through the courts and then he has to go on a, a local authority housing list. So, uh, you know, what's the interaction there between all the agencies that need to be in, 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 in interactive around these issues? Deputy, Deputy O'Dowd. Um, I'd like to welcome the work that's been done by you and the excellent results obviously you're getting. Just have a couple of queries, especially, um, I apologise for being late, your statistics, page 12, 13 and 14, uh, if I'm reading the first one right, and if I'm not, tell me straight away, it seems that if you have mortgage difficulties in certain counties, uh, your chances of success are higher uh, than there would be in other counties. It seems to me very strange that Waterford seems, seems to have a 22% uh, a success rate of doing deals, if that's the correct way of reading those figures, compared to Dublin City, which is 62 So I'm just trying to wonder, are there issues is regarding where geographic issues, number one, uh, because you, you seem to have worked them out nationally per county, why did you do that? Uh, and the second issue is that are there mortgage lenders who are much more... Uh, uh, are much more uh, open to doing deals than other ones. And specifically, could I ask if, I think my colleague uh, Deputy Durkin raised the question of people who might have been overstretched and borrowed maybe from a very difficult uh, financial base, got more money than they should have got from, you know, some of the uh, not usual mortgage uh, companies. In other words, they're borrowing at extremely high rates, even at the best of times. Uh, do you have, do you have a, issues around about companies that will not do business with you or tend to do less business than, say, uh, other companies? And, you know, should we not go after those? Uh, in other words, if some of them, like I don't want to name names here, but I know there are some companies which charge hugely high interest rates, much more so than others, and are they inclined to do deals at all or are they, are they pushing the client to the wall, um, if you have a comment on that? Thank you. Is there any other deputy wishing? Deputy Coppinger. Um Sorry, I missed your introduction, but I just have um, one question about the take-up of the uh, PIAs, which I, I heard you referring to as I came in. Um, I think we'd have to say that given the level of indebtedness in relation to mortgages, it's been a very low take-up of this scheme, which is important for us because given that this is one of the major government initiated schemes to deal with mortgage debt, if people aren't able to, are, are attracted to it, we continue to have a problem. So um, at the end of 2015, there were just under 62,000 owner-occupier mortgages in arrears um, and there was 23,000 buy-to-lets. So out of 85,000 mortgages in arrears and 105,000 restructured mortgages, only a thousand or half a percent 
have involved uh, PIA. Um, so I'm wondering why there is such a low take-up. Now, obviously, the fee was some of the costs were abolished by the government, but there are still other costs that people do have. There's a, an initial consultation fee, and then there can be other fees down the line. Um, but even given that the government abolished it, there still hasn't been a huge take-up on the graph that you, you, in your presentation. So why has it been so low? Is it because the terms of the PIAs are too punitive? Um, for example, a single person with no car is allowed €218 Euros a week to live on. Everything else has to go into repaying debts for six to seven years while the PIA is in force. So you might get some people taking the attitude, well, I'll stay in the rears in the hope that I'll get a better job, my income will increase, um, I'll sort out my debts later, rather than living under a punitive regime, relatively speaking. You know, to live on 200 euros roughly a week is not easy, particularly in Dublin or in, in a city. Um, and uh, they also may be hoping the house prices will rise again and they could sell their house. So, would you agree that that might be a factor in it that maybe people uh, would find that very difficult? I just want to ask you about your relationship with the vulture funds. Do you find the state-owned banks or the private banks any different to your experience in dealing with the vulture funds? Um, because they now control 47,000 mortgages, so I'm wondering how much dealings you've had with them. Um, do, you, do you agree or disagree that the government should have allowed these in to the system. And just lastly, on debt write-downs, um, one of the things that I certainly would argue is that we need a write-down on mortgage debt to release people from you know, the albatross that's there. The burden that's there would have a huge impact in society as well in terms of young families having money to spend on their children and, and so on. Um, do you have any estimates for how much owner-occupier mortgage debt has been written off by the banks, um, and how does it compare to the amount of developers' debts that the banks have written off? Thank you, Deputy. Before I go, uh, Deputy Collins, are you okay? I'm going to ask a question on the vulture phones, but so you're happy. Cup, but you're asked the question, so. uh, Mr. O'Connor. Great. I mean, maybe to take the, the last set of, of questions first. Um, we have helped over 1,000 people do PIAs and over 3,000 people overall when you look at the, the suite of solutions that we provide. And I think for those people, it has been hugely valuable and certainly much of the feedback that we have received is that you know, it is life-changing or even saved lives uh, on, in some cases we're, we're dealing with such a, a sensitive subject. Um, however, I would have expected the numbers to be higher uh, than they are, given what we've come uh, through over the last number of years. Having said that, we are a new organisation. It does take time for people to become familiar with the solutions, but clearly we do need to work on the communications. Uh, I would say, though, also, um, since the Insolvency Service opened, we have had uh, approximately 120,000 informal deals done uh, by creditors. And that number was zero before we opened. And the simple reality was that if I was somebody in mortgage arrears and I rang up the bank and said, I've in, I'm in difficulty, uh, I'd like to talk to you and do something about it, uh, the response would simply be, well, we'll phone you back when, when we're ready. Because all of the negotiating power was on the bank side. Whereas as soon as we opened, the debtor was able to say, I'd like to meet you to try and do a deal here that's to our mutual benefit, that keeps me in my home. And in doing, and if you don't, I will go to the insolvency service. So it was a, a, an important catalyst or, or, or sort of change point whereby all of a sudden banks, it was in their interest to start doing uh, informal deals. And no issue with informal deals where they're sustainable, but at least now people do have the option to go to the personal insolvency practitioner. In terms of other uh, reasons w that, that you, you wondered whether or not it, w it was feeding into to, to the low numbers, uh, the reasonable living expenses, um, we have found that in the vast majority of cases, people have actually been living on far less than we would allow uh, until they've engaged with the PIP. So because they've been doing their best to pay off as much as they possibly can every given week, they've been really going in tight in terms of their, 
the, the ex amount of money they have available for food, clothing and, and what have you. Our legislation specifically says that a reasonable standard of living includes contributing to society and having an, a, an amount that you can save each, each week for the rainy day, as well as uh, social and, and other expenditure reasons. It's not an easy amount to live on, but actually what we're finding for a lot of people is that it's more than what they've been living on, perhaps for the last number, number of years. And it is a barrier upon which no bank no creditor can force you to live below, uh, which is not necessarily the case uh, in, in other situations. And in relation to fees, um, certainly our feedback too from debtors is a perception that to avail of this solution it will cost me money. But I suppose my message here today is that it is free. It does not cost money to engage with a personal insolvency practitioner now that we have this, this new service. And you know, we will do our best to sing that from the, from the rooftops because it is something that hopefully will result in, in more and more people availing of, of, of the solutions. Um, in terms of the, the Deputy, you mentioned the statistics and, and Dublin and Waterford, perhaps we're not making it quite as clear as we should. It's not um, identifying different acceptance rates, but more so just the number of people availing of the solutions by county. So when in Waterford, uh, in, in the statistic I'm looking at, um, per thousand of population, there's three times as many people applying in Waterford than there is in Dublin, but it doesn't uh, break down acceptance rates so by county. We don't have that information. It's simply activity levels rather than, than actual uh, uh, acceptance rates. Um, in terms then of the engagement from lenders, uh, as I said, it is, uh, constructive at this stage and it is positive to see. Um, we do now have this new phenomenon of the so-called vulture funds uh, owning uh, a number of mortgage books, but the legislation does not distinguish who the owner of the loan is. The solutions remain the same. And now that we have this court review process, um, if the PIP proposes a reasonable solution, um, that is the solution that will, will be run with or imposed. And when I talked about the uh, 11 or so cases that have gone through that court review process, many of those would have involved um, the so-called vulture funds as well. So the legislation does now sort of create an even playing field uh, for borrowers, irrespective of who their, their loan owner uh, is. So just on that point, are you saying then that, uh, that regardless of who you borrow from, uh, there's a level playing field when you go to court? Uh, but it's, it's the question of the reluctance. Of course, they can't, they can't not engage the, bar, the, the lenders if you go through the PIP. Is that the point, really? Excuse me? In, in other words, if I have a problem with my mortgage, if I go through the PIP, the borrower must, sorry, the lender must engage with me, yeah. even though they may not want to. Correct. Yeah, right. So that's yeah. a very powerful thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, again, I, I would have worked on the corporate insolvency side before taking up this job. And where we would have been advising companies that were in financial distress, um, trying to get the lender to engage was very much down to what the lender's preference was. But as soon as an examiner was appointed, the lender was breaking down the door to meet with you because they realised that they only had a couple of weeks to influence what you might do. And it's the same way now for a PIP. The borrower will, or the lender will immediately engage with the PIP to try and, and work out a solution that, that's in the, to the mutual benefit of all parties. That's a very important point, isn't it? It's the most important point of all, really, yeah. for the public. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, another couple of questions that were raised was the stage at which a PIP could help somebody in repossession. Um, Two, two points maybe just to say to that. Firstly, the earlier you engage, the better, as, as with, with many things, but it is never too late as well. Uh, the example that I cited of the, the couple who had really resigned themselves to homelessness, they were in the repossession courts at the final stage, so the, the court registrar was about to announce uh, the date upon which the repossession order would be granted or become effective. Um, but the, the Land and Conveyancing and Reform Act allows for a specific adjournment to consult with a PIP. So it's never too late, but the sooner or the earlier, the better. Uh, and in relation to local authorities, we deal with local authorities on a, sort of a number of, of levels. Um, one, in terms of ensuring 
that they are an outlet for, for passing the information and the materials that we have available for debtors. Uh, and we're making sure that uh, people who deal with people in, in, on the housing list are aware of our solutions so that they can pass on that information. But we also deal with local authorities where they're actually the landlord and they might have somebody uh, in arrears. But uh, certainly it's, it's, it's very constructive and I think both parties always have the, the debtor's interest uh, at heart there. Um, but we would deal with the, the bigger local authorities on a one-to-one -one basis, but also then at where there's local authority conferences and so on, we've attended to, to ensure that they're aware of it. Um, so hopefully that deals with the questions that have been asked. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. There are one or two remaining questions, so I'll take them at this stage. And uh, Deputy Ryan. Just a very quick one. Um, Mr O'Connor, I'm delighted to hear you describe a reasonably successful process, but is there, is there anything you would like to do uh, in terms of solutions that the legislation doesn't allow you to do? Simple as. And Mr. Ryan, I just, or Mr. Connor, I'd just like to add, I find myself somewhat in agreement with Deputy Coppinger when I, uh, I was looking at the 3,000 clients that you have dealt with. Um, and your own opening statement, you referred to the fact you gave the case of the couple who were in court and happened to bump into a pip. It's sort of shocked me to think that somebody would end up in the courts, actually in court, unaware of the supports that were available. And then you went on in your statement to say uh, that you had a, para, a section on communications, but you specifically talked about um, a promotional campaign for quarter one of 2016. And I suppose the first thing that it said to me was, well, is that a sustained campaign uh, over the course of the year? Because undoubtedly, the solutions you have been successful but an awful lot of clients, an awful lot of potential clients, don't seem to be getting to you. So that, that you might address that. And secondly, of the 3,000 clients you dealt with, in percentage terms, how many of them had issues that were primarily caused by their own private residents? In other words, the debt primarily, rather than maybe additional loans or, you know, I know everybody has credit cards and so forth, but the, the substantial issue was only their own home, rather than a buy to let or anything else, but just around their own principal private residence. Thank you. I think that concludes the questions. Is everybody happy at that? Okay. Mr. Sorry, just on the vulture funds, I hear, I hear what you're saying that they have to, but are they willing to? Thank you. And Mr. O'Connor. Sustainability that's being used on a regular basis. The, 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 the lender determines whether the individual's uh, uh, capacity is sustainable or not. And uh, as Deputy Cowan has referred to, the, you, you can appeal to the courts. But what's been the experience in that? Uh, after all, the bank said three or four or five years ago, this is totally sustainable, and awarded a loan on foot of that. And now it is totally unsustainable. There has to be a, 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 an answer to the question that arises immediately. I think, I think Deputy Durkin, in reply to Deputy Cowan and Mr O'Connor, you can, you can correct me. Eight of the 11 cases uh, found in favour of the homeowner, um, not the, not the bank's, but Mr O'Connor. You can, you can reply to those. That, that's okay. correct, Chair. Um, I mean, in terms of sustainability, the, the personal insolvency practitioner uh, has to undertake a number of statutory steps or, or duties under the Act as they're advising the debtor. And one of those is to certify that the person returns to solvency, so thereby under, underwriting the sustainability of the arrangement. So whether or not a bank or, or anybody else opined on what might be sustainable or what might not be sustainable in the past, it is the personal insolvency practitioner in, in their statutory role that ultimately determines that. Mr. Chairman, that's not answering my question. My question is, is simply this. I find it difficult to understand how a lending agency can have three, four or five years ago decided that a particular application for a loan was sustainable because otherwise they shouldn't have approved it but now suddenly determine that it is unsustainable and they now demand repossession or they demand the sale of the assets or whatever the case may be. And that question is, 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 is one that I would be very interested to, to know because I've dealt with a good few of those cases too. Yeah, Thank sorry. you, Deputy. Yeah, Mr. Deputy, I mean, I, I, if I might suggest, that's probably a question more appropriate to creditors themselves. Uh, the insolvency service don't have a remit, nor do we look at the origins of the loan. But as I said, as soon as a person engages with a personal insolvency practitioner, they will fix that loan. 
whatever about its history. And, and well, uh, they do in the sense that over 80% of proposals 